Welcome to Philanthropy in Action, where we uncover the wonderful stories of people who give their time, talent, and treasure to change the world. These are stories of philanthropy. I am Maxim Thorne, and I teach Philanthropy in Action at Yale University. Inga Reichenbach is the Vice President from Yale University, who's in charge of all of our fundraising. Thank you, Inga, for joining us. Thanks for having me. And we also have these wonderful, dedicated, and brilliant Yale students with us. I'd like to ask them to introduce themselves, starting with Joan. I'm Joan Gass. I'm a senior from Dallas, Texas, and I'm double majoring in International Studies and Women, Gender, Sexuality Studies. Hi, my name is Leslie Bull. I'm a junior from Arlington, Virginia. I'm a political science major, and I'm studying international development. Hi, my name is Christina Lee. I'm a junior from San Jose, California, and I study history. Hi, my name is Robert Jichnicki. I'm a freshman from New York City, and I'm studying computer science. I'm Ellen Bankson. I'm a sophomore from Richland, Washington, and I'm studying chemical engineering. I'm Carl Chen. I'm a junior from outside Los Angeles, and I'm studying sociology. <laughs> Thank you. Inga, you have done something quite remarkable very recently. In the worst economic climate since the Great Depression, you have closed a capital campaign for Yale University raising over $3.8 billion. How did you manage those challenges and how did you succeed? Well, I have to admit it was an adventure and not one that we had planned for. You know, I've been in development for a long time and when you have a campaign, there's always a recession in there. So you kind of, you know, go with the flow there. But this one was so different as we all, you know, experience. And I will never forget October 2008, which is when everything came to a grinding halt. Now, luckily, we were ahead, way ahead of our schedule for the campaign. We were in year three already, and we ran about a year ahead of schedule. But because we were thinking we were doing so well, in June of 2008, we increased the goal to three and a half billion, and then came October. What was so new and different and scary about that time was that this financial crisis was something that was completely unpredictable on what would happen next. It created a tremendous sense of uncertainty. Nobody knew where this was going. Nobody knew where the free fall would end. And that was the most, um, that was the most difficult part to deal with. Because obviously our donors, even those who may not have been completely you know, affected by this crisis, there was the uncertainty. They didn't know what was going to happen. And so for about two years, it was just almost impossible to get people to make new commitments. Now obviously we were still you know, determined to reach the goal and so we shifted focus. And we really shifted focus on not the many, many, many different campaign priorities that we had, but we focused on the core. We said, okay, we need gifts to financial aid. We need gifts for professorships, gifts that build the endowment and help in this financial crisis. And we took a, a, you know, a very tough look at what we could accomplish and what not. So you have heard the president speak about, you know, we stopped our capital projects. You know, almost all buildings you know, got stopped. But we've, we figured out there were a few that we might be able to finish. And so we said we concentrate on those. So the, the, the secret behind it was that we were very, very focused as a staff. Now, the secret behind the relationship with our donors was that we didn't drop them when the bad times came. We, initially, they didn't want to see us because they thought we wanted to ask them for a gift. But once they realized that we just wanted to maintain the relationship, stay in touch, express that we understand that this is a difficult time, you know, we were able to stay involved, have them stay involved with Yale. And then, the last year of the campaign happened, and somehow people either were used to the new normal, or they, you know, they saw where things were going for themselves, and they were s so dedicated to Yale that they didn't want to miss participating in the campaign. So while the first two years of the crisis, we, our giving dropped significantly, in the last year of the campaign, our donors gave 
$862 million. This is by far the largest amount that was ever given to Yale in a given year. And you know, it shows the commitment that our donors had. So I have to say the credit does not go to the staff. <laughs> the credit goes to our donors, to right. the philanthropists. And, and y I remember seeing a graph for people who are involved in fundraising, especially for large organizations. And I remember seeing a graph that someone said, which was a flat graph. Mm -hmm. The line was flat. And they said, this is the new up. <laughs> you, on the other hand, and I, and I really want to bring this home, you broke your, your own record, right? Because from a $3 billion campaign to a $3.5 billion, you actually brought in $3.81 billion. Uh, th that was a remarkable achievement. Um, but it also highlights something uh, which is about the capacity that, that our donors had to do this and the capacity that Yale had to manage those relationships. How, is that replicable for other entities in the country? You used the key word for this, and that's relationships. You know, what I see today in philanthropy happening often is what I would call transactional. You know, I know you have money, so I come to you and ask you for a gift, and you give me something, then I turn away and go to the next person. That is not what we define as philanthropy, because philanthropy really is a relationship. And it is a relationship that we set out to establish in a university, to establish with our donors, our alumni, for life. So we are not in it for you know, uh, just the one gift and then we draw people. We are in it for you know, keeping our alumni involved with the university. And as they get to know the behind the scenes of the university, you know, what are the struggles, what are the priorities, what is the vision, what do we want to accomplish, you know, they understand that it takes money. And those who have money, you know, then voluntarily participate in and participate in it much more generously than if you had just asked for money and, you know, here we go. Right. Joan, you have a question. So picking off that idea of relationships with people, I think um, at Yale, we talk about a lot of things, but talking about money is a sensitive topic. And, and there's a, a question about being able to uh, ask people for money without imposing or maintain a sense of authenticity in the relationship, not mm -hmm. feeling like it's just because that other person has money. So I was wondering if you could talk to us maybe about an example of a conversation you've had with a big donor and how you've maintained that relationship knowing that, that money is the thing that holds uh, that relationship together. Yeah. I wouldn't say that money is what holds the relationship together because then it would be so targeted on a goal mm -hmm. and you know then the sincerity the the seriousness about the relationship uh, you know would be compromised. I mean you really I believe uh, have to be committed to what you are fundraising for you have to believe in that. So there are certain things that I would feel very comfortable raising money for and that's higher education. There are other things where my passion isn't as strong. It's, there's interest, but I don't feel as passionate about it as I do about higher education. So you let those relationships develop. And that's the other thing. You, know, you can't say it takes one visit and then you have a relationship. No, it takes much more. You know what it takes to develop a re real good friendship, a real relationship. So you don't focus on money. You focus on the person's interests, and you focus on where these interests may have a counterpart, a match at Yale. And so you let it, you let it develop slowly. And you know, just the other day, because you asked for an example of, an, of, a, mm -hmm. of an, a conversation, I was meeting with the president with somebody who, for whom this was the first meeting with Yale. It's not an, a Yale alumnus. And so I happened to be there a little earlier uh, than the president because it was the weather was terrible and the taxis didn't drive right and um, so I happened to be by myself with this donor for the first 15 minutes or I say donor he's not a donor yet um, and we had you know and I could see he asked me immediately are you the development person I said yes I'm from development and I could see that he had a certain expectation of what I would do next 
And I just struck up a, a conversation with him. He is an amazingly interesting person, and it was very easy to, you know, to, to get in, engage in a conversation. Well, afterwards, uh, a day later, I got feedback from the fourth person who was there, who came with him, and he said, you know, he was very pleased to meet both of us, obviously. He was very pleased to meet the president, but he also commented that I was very different from other fundraisers who always immediately go toward talking about a gift. And in my view, that's not philanthropy. That's not enabling people to do what they want to do, what they can do with their resources that are, for some people, are incredibly big and for others not so big. So my role is to facilitate something, but through a relationship that is truly honest. And I have a, role for my, a rule for myself, you know, three strikes and you're out. Uh, if I don't, if a donor doesn't connect with me, if I'm not able to connect with a donor, then I say it's probably better for the institution that somebody else steps in. So. Does the changing climate offer opportunities unexpected opportunities. So for example, there's a national debate going on about whether people should even go to college and whether snobs, we're snobs. So we, all of us are at a, a, at a university getting undergraduate degrees or advanced degrees or mm -hmm. are, are graduates. So obviously, as a person who cares, as you said passionately about higher education, this debate would trouble you. I would think, as an, as an institution, how do you interact when the climate is changing around us in, the, in these kinds of ways? It is a troubling, um, a troubling uh, situation, but you know, with every troubling situation, there is also an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the mention or, or the, the comment that we heard recently that it is snobbish to you know, aspire to a university, a college degree, is a different facet of another question that has been around for a longer time, and that is, why should I give to a wealthy institution? Mm -hmm. And Yale happens to be a wealthy institution. So this is a question that we have heard a lot, um, that we have heard um, you know, from in primarily from individuals who really are not involved. And lack a certain understanding of you know, what private institutions are about. So you know, how do you think about you know, why should you give to Yale? It's so wealthy, could do anything it wants to do. I think if you, there, there is somewhere in there a legitimate question. And the legitimate question in there is, tell us what you do with your wealth. Tell us, you know, are you using your wealth for the public good? Are you using your wealth to do something good in society? Mm -hmm. Or are you squandering it by, I don't know, doing what with it? Now, when you, when you look at the question from that perspective, you know, it becomes a lot easier to explain why people should give to an institution like Yale or others. But first of all, you can start out there are two models of funding higher education, right? Public and private. So you look at what, what you know, you compare the two systems. Mm -hmm. And what's striking is in every survey that you read, you know, that ranks institutions, you have to go through 20 institutions at least to come to the first public institution. In the last survey, it was rank number 22, it was Berkeley. Only then do public institutions begin to act. Now look at Berkeley. That's an incredibly interesting situation. Berkeley and the California State University system was the treasure of higher education, of public higher education. And some from you are from California, so you know what's happening there. When the political climate shifts, when budgets get tied, you know, people don't hesitate to cut higher education. And what the 
what the California state system is going through right now is really tragic because it was such a, a stellar you know, system. Now, these systems you know, so are subject to you know, the vagaries of political you know, uh, developments, the vagaries of, of economic developments. On the private side, you know, the individuals decided who founded these institutions said, you know, I'm going to rely on myself. I'm going to rely on a different system. I'm going to start up this institution. Then I charge something out to those people who want to be here. But then I want that everybody who graduates understands that you know, they have an opportunity, maybe even a little bit of a moral obligation, but at least an opportunity to, to hand over this institution to the next generation in a better way, so that the institution is better off. And that's what endowments are. Endowments are nothing but gifts that were given and are well managed. So, you know, an institution like Yale, with the big endowment it has, uh, is capable of playing a much more impactful, uh, impactful role than other institutions. You know, when you look at advances in science, it costs money. You know, 300 years ago, nobody talked about gene sequencing. Well, today, if you want to be a player, you have to do that. But through these advances and through investment in science, this is also what fuels the economic development, the economic health of our country. You know, and aside from the fact that you know, it's always good to educate people who are capable of providing good leadership when they go out in the world. And then one thing I just want to mention uh, to that is you know, the private institutions have been a major factor in social mobility. Because when you think about it, sometimes it is less expensive to come to a place like Yale or a private institution than to go to a public institution. Why? Because philanthropists, donors, have understand that and have given a lot of money to financial aid. You know, um, <coughs> I see students dying to jump in on, on this conversation. But I wanted to actually, <laughs> <coughs> I'm going to start over. Um, <coughs> I know students are dying to get in on this conversation. But I wanted to uh, talk about what you just said, which is my personal experience. I remember <coughs> as an immigrant child uh, to the United States when my aunt, who was taking me around to various universities my first year and took me to City College in New York and took me uh, to Pace University and, and some others. And, you know, she had lived an immigrant life and she had gone to City College and she felt this is how one does it. And I remember I was eligible for some financial aid, uh, but I would have to take a full-time job nevertheless and pay my own mm -hmm. many other things that make it possible. And then uh, this is prior to me applying to the Ivy League, which I thought was so beyond what one could afford. And the, the reality was when I got my package, Yale was affordable in a way that City College, which is supposed to be the one yeah. that should be affordable for most people, was not. And it, most people find this so hard to believe, and including my family, that it was actually much more doable for me to go to Yale than to go to the local uh, colleges. And I think a lot of people don't realize yeah. that. Um, but Carl has been dying to <laughs> jump into this conversation. So sure. Carl? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little interested in when, when you just kind of gave us um, the idea of why someone should donate to Yale. I was wondering um, how receptive your donors are to your message that you just gave right now. What kind of donors are you appealing to? And is it, is it like, really wealthy businessmen, or is it more like um, people who have made their fortune in like entrepreneurs or uh, maybe at, in law or something? Or, uh, and kind of also, do they have their own agendas when they come in? Do they want specific changes, or do they just want to follow the university's lead? Mm -hmm. 
That's a really interesting question. And the first part, you know, what kinds of donors do we work with? We try to work with, you know, the whole alumni group. Obviously, not everybody is, you know, willing to engage or so. Uh, but you know, through our annual fund, you know, everybody has an opportunity to give a small gift, and you know, they add up. They add up significantly. We have, you know, we raise about twenty-six million dollars in unrestricted gifts to the annual fund. But then we work with individuals who have, you know, capacity to give fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand or a million or all the way up to, you know, nine-figure gifts. So. We try to, you know, cover everybody, and even we are working with parents, meaning not parents who themselves went to Yale, but parents whose only connection to Yale is through their their kids who are currently here, and you know, obviously those individuals who give us, you know, we have parents who gave us ten million dollars, um, in addition to paying tuition and all of that. So we try to to work with as many donors as we can, but. It's a you, you, Carl, you, you talk about a very intriguing issue, and that is, you know, does a donor come with ideas? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, is a donor just waiting for us to tell them this is what we like you to do? Well, obviously, you know, it's a, it, it's, it, it's a, you know, across the board. Mm -hmm. um, the university always has its priorities, its vision, et cetera, and obviously when we go out, we would like to, you know, Make a compelling case that individuals should, you know, give to that. But when somebody has the capacity and the interest of making an extraordinarily large gift, you know, they tend to come with their own ideas. Mm. And then it is becoming a very interesting, uh, interesting, uh, you know, kind of negotiation. Um, and I, negotiation is not the right word. It becomes a very interesting conversation that sometimes may take very long to complete. Because of course, you know, if, if I have a hundred million dollars to give away, I probably gave it some thought what I want to do with it. And you know, I have a dream. I, I want something right. you know, to happen, and I think Yale is the best place for it to happen. So you know, what is there to talk about? And we say, well, you know, we have these other needs over here, or it and so on and so forth. But you know, we have to remember, you know, the beginning of philanthropy, the golden age of philanthropy. You know, it was the big donors, the big gifts, who made things happen. Mm -hmm. So we better take, you know, seriously when people come with big ideas and say, rather than saying, well, if we can't, if, if we we have to do it exactly this way. I, we don't want to do it, but to think about so what is behind the idea? You know, what does this person really want to accomplish, and how do I? You know, what is here where this would fit? And so you you, you kind of try in those conversations to for both sides to move toward one another, and come to something in the end, and that's important that both parties are really happy about. So two of you do international studies. You know, we have the Jackson Institute um, that was funded through a gift that was the idea of the donor. And you know, while Yale was interested and heavily invested in internationalization at the time, you know, we were more thinking of finding scholarships to send students abroad, you know, in the summertime or you know, getting uh, international students here, things of that nature. So we didn't have the establishment of an institute on our list. But the donors made a compelling case, and it forced us, it forced Yale to think about it. And you know, by the time the agreement was signed, you know, both the donors as well as Yale had moved from where they were when we started the conversation to something where everybody is very happy. And you know, I have heard President Levin talk about the Jackson Institute as the best academic startup he's ever seen. You know, so it worked. Carl, yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's really interesting that you going back to the first part of the question, how there's so many different types of donors at Yale. I mm -hmm. think um, as students, when we walk around campus, you know, we hear about the Jackson Institute or Bass Library or Sterling, so we hear all these big names, and we think, you know, only 
the big donors really make a difference at Yale, I yeah. guess. And uh, it feels like that maybe, I, I don't know, I, I don't know if you have a lot of conversations with students sometimes, but it feels like there's maybe a little bit of a, uh, a culture to pursue monetary success to kind of like, there's this expectation that I'm gonna have to like give back to Yale somehow later on or give back to the world somehow and like what's the best way to do that. And it, it feels like there's a little bit of like a, a pressure to kind of be that big name donor a little bit. I hope that you can convince yourself that there shouldn't be that pressure. I think the only thing that Yale expects of you is that you become a leader in whatever you are going to do, you know. And, you know, many people find uh, their passion in social service or something or in environmental issues. Certainly, we have a lot of schools here whose alumni are not participating in this, you know, Wall Street, you know, kind of game. Market, yeah. Look at, we have an excellent drama school. I was shocked when I learned, you know, how these, you know, these are the best of the best, you know, on, you know, coming actors, you know, they still have to waitress after they, you know, and be waiters after they graduate. You know, they usually are not, could not be expected to become, but they become leaders in in the arts. Music school, the same. Nursing school, you know, what would we do without the nursing school? It's an incredibly interesting school because it's not what we think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is much more uh, influenced, uh, you know, much more impactful on the higher level. Uh, take forestry and environmental studies. When you go into environmental issues, you are not going to be one of the top earners in the country divinity school. So, you know, actually, you know, a lot of, of, of the schools and of the things we teach are not meant to lead people to a life that will end up with great economic reward. Uh, and so we w couldn't possibly expect that, you know, these big gifts would come from there. I think when philanth philanthropy really works, then everybody does contribute what they can and what they feel passionate about. I think that would be successful philanthropy. And I tell you one other thing, in the, in the crisis, you know, before we started the campaign, our annual fund volunteers, you know, class volunteers, uh, their biggest concern was, you know, with these big numbers, is our $100 gift, is our, you know, small contribution, is that going to make any difference? Is it going to count? Is it going to do anything? And I assured them it always is important. But you know, the global crisis really you know, made believers out of them. Because when you have every year $26 million that you can spend where you need it, that's, you know, you need a half a billion dollars of endowment to, to generate that. So it does count, it did count, and it made a huge difference having that. Is, is there a tension, though, when you are having these conversations between what Carl said, which is adding your name to it. Because I think years ago, for example, I think there was a conversation at Yale, way before our time, about should colleges bear the name of donors? And oh, our that was in my time. Oh, that was in your time. <laughs> and the colleges do not bear the name of donors. Yeah. But other things do, like the Bass Library, the Jackson Institute, and, mm -hmm. and, and others. Um, given what Carl just said, which is students may have a, a feeling of altering their life's choices based on that, is there a tension and, and how do those conversations actually go? I can see that there could be a tension. I can see that, you know, when you are surrounded by these big names, etc., that, um, you know, it might be a little bit intimidating or an expectation. But, you know, the other thing is, there, we have had philanthropists here whose name is not on anything. Mm -hmm. So one always has the choice of giving anonymously or privately. Uh, if one wants to escape that, you know, if this person did that, then I ought to be doing that. Um, but, you know, I in Germany that debate is also, you know, when people give. They, Germany does not have a culture of philanthropy, at least not in, in the American sense. But they are trying to introduce this now. And so a big issue is, um, you know, significant donors, there are significant donors, but very few admit to it. So you 
my alma mater is the University of Heidelberg, so you get an announcement from there that they are, being, they are able to do this, that, or the other because of a gift, and that's all. And you wonder, what can I believe here? You know, transparency. So if somebody is willing to put their name on the gift, that helps everybody. I know we always say it helps, you know, encouraging other people to give. That's one thing. But you also want to know, you know, where does the university get the resources from to do what it is doing? I think that sense of transparency is very important. So I am for names on buildings, um, but I respect everybody's desire to be private about it, anonymous about it. Um, but it is, you know, there are many di dimensions to, to this question. Christina, I know that you're, you're dying to get in on this conversation. Definitely. I wanted to continue this conversation about anonymous giving versus having big names attached mm -hmm. to donations. We recently read a book called Rambam Slatter where the author argued based on the philosophy of Maimonides saying that anonymous giving is actually perhaps the most noble form of giving, the best form of giving, but obviously we're an institution that's marked with names as Carl touched upon earlier. So how do you reconcile these two perspectives? Does Yale value anonymous donations in a different way than these big name donations and do you engage with these different types of donors differently? Well, you know, Yale values, you know, anonymous gifts and, and gifts that are named in the same way because it's a gift and it's given in the spirit to help the university. Um, I think to me it's a personal choice um, what a donor should do if he or she feels comfortable having their name on it. Uh, I think it is good because it reminds others uh, that, you know, this did not grow on trees. You know, this did not come from nowhere. People actually took responsibility to, to nurture this place and give it the resources so that it could become what it is. But at the same time, you know, an anonymous gift can have the same impact. I just would not be completely comfortable with only anonymous giving because it just would raise, in my view, questions and um, should raise questions with others about transparency and, you know, what is the financial situation. Do we ever flip that question, <coughs> which is a donor that might have a background that is a little bit complicated or, or disturbing, that we would prefer not to be transparent about? I would not advice into <laughs> going that road. Uh, you know, part of why we are so relationship-based in our fundraising is we want to know the donor. We don't want Yale to be used for a purpose that is not philanthropic. And so the donors who have made these big gifts to Yale, they all have a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 year relationship with Yale. So we know them and they know us, and it is a good match. I don't think we want to be in a position where, you know, Yale is going to be used for, you know, selfish purposes for publicity or something like that. Christina? How do you gauge the philanthropic motives of a donor? Um, is it through what they tell in conversation? Is it about, about what type of careers they pursue? How do you gauge um, how honorable their motives are? I think you, through conversation is how you determine this best. And as I said, through a long-standing relationship, you know, over a long time, you know, they get to know us with all the things that we might not be so happy having out there. Um, but we also get to know them. And uh, it's like with a relationship with friends, you know, you get to know them even though, you know, you couldn't exactly tell where you exactly, you know, uh, figured out where they are. But, um, you know, it is important that, you know, philanthropy, you know, be exercised, or that we call philanthropy what philanthropy truly is, and not marketing is not philanthropy. You know, getting visibility, getting, you know, um, something for it, it's not philanthropy. Are you a saleswoman? I... <laughs> completely object to the characterization of being a salesperson. 
And I'm, but I'm glad you bring it up because this is, you know, what I see so often. People say, oh, you are, you are selling Yale. I'm not selling Yale. I'm making possible for, for an institution that has a lot to offer in terms of service to society and to a person who have the resources to do something there, to get together and do it in an efficient way. That's not marketing. That's not selling. That's, that's making a deal. No, that's enabling people to dream their dreams and for institutions like Yale or other universities to really become better and better and better. So, so is there a way you can capture what you said? Are you, so you're not a deal maker, you're not a salesperson, you are a? A facilitator, a mediator, mm -hmm. a person who brings people together. Okay. Very noble. Leslie. Um, I'd like to ask a question about corporate social responsibility, which mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about a little bit in class today. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, do you think the Yale Corporation specifically has any kind of moral obligation or responsibility to give back to public good beyond just Yale? Um, for instance, do you think Yale has any sort of moral obligation towards New Haven as being part of the New Haven community? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, the New Haven community is, is a great example. Um, when President uh, Levin became president, I mean, Yale was a poster child for a number of things, and one was it for the terrible area it was surrounded by. And, you know, it was a recognition that a great university cannot exist unless the community it is in also participates in it. So Yale has done an enormous amount of, of uh, contributions, uh, of help, you know, the economic development was all, or much of it was driven through Yale, through Yale resources, through Yale, you know, people, Poos Alexander, for example, he has, has done a lot in that respect. Uh, beyond that, there's a lot that is um, not so visible, like our payments or the get, get getting the Apple Store here. That was a, a great, you know, contribution to the, uh, to the community, and it was only because Yale was behind it and, and he made it happen. And then there are a lot of, in, you know, not visible things. So, for example, the uh, the involvement with the school system here. You know, Yale signed the New York, uh, the the New Haven Promise, mm -hmm. and so Yale is going to pay for every student who has, you know, cer meets certain criteria, qualifies, uh, pays for his or her tuition. I think that's a tremendous uh, involvement and investment in the community. We also have, through the so some gifts to the music school, we have a tremendous uh, outreach program of the music students in the local schools. You know, they have academies. They they teach you know music because that's the first thing that gets cut. You know, so so Yale is really Yale and its students and faculty are investing quite a bit in in New Haven and definitely feel that social responsibility. Was it difficult to keep that same focus on social responsibility going during the recession? No. There was no, there was no cut in this. We signed, the New, York, uh, we signed the New Haven Promise during the recession. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, you know, that commitment to the, to the communities here. Why do you think that other institutions don't follow that same sort of uh, uh, integrity, which is to hold on to their commitments to their social responsibility w in, in, t in the tough times? Well, um, I can't speak for you know, the thinking or what happened at other institutions. Um, I would think that you know, universities, by and large, are conscious of it. And if they are, and they get reminded be that they are tax exempt entities that do not pay taxes on their real estate. So, you know, there is a sense that you have to make contributions in a different way. Whether in, a, in tough economic times, you know, you have to kind of retreat on the margins a little bit might happen, but I don't think any university that's in, a, in an urban setting can afford to ignore its surroundings. Um, there is a self-preserving interest uh, involved in that as well, I have to say, because you, know, you just have to make these contributions or else I think uh, we would strengthen the case that universities should not be tax exempt. Correct. 
So to continue with the idea of um, social responsibility, a sense of social responsibility mm -hmm. as motivating philanthropy, um, earlier we had the opportunity to speak with the founder of the Ixtatan Foundation, which funds a, a high school in a village in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. So what might you say to a donor who is interested in education but is like trying to make that decision between Yale and that other organization? And what do you think it's fair to sort of Cat, try to categorize the morality of one over another, or like to say that one donation could be has the potential, or should be considered more philanthropic. Def definitely no to the latter statement. Okay. Uh, philanthropy is philanthropy, whether it's big or small, whether it's here or there. So I would, you know, there is there is no question about that. But you raise a very interesting uh, example because. Um, I have another example to that, and that is when we launched the campaign in 2006, the, the uh, public phase. I, you know, we organized a, a multimedia show to show a little bit what the campaign was about. And we featured some of the students at the time, so this was all before your time. And I had, we had two young women there who founded Mercado Global. Uh, you've heard of it? And uh, you know they found it while they were students here. And they got the training and teaching to do that here. And last I heard, it's still thriving. They are not together. One, you know, one was in, uh, from India, and she went back to her home. And uh, the other uh, uh, young woman involved is still at it. And uh, what she is doing is exactly what you are describing. Uh, they help uh, women uh, in, in, in cooperatives there to, with their crafts, uh, develop sales channels for it, help with the design a little bit so that it can be sold, that people s want to buy it here, and all, th and that the proceeds all go to pay the women, obviously, for the things, but the profits all go into the school system there, so that every kid in that cooperative can go to school. Now, these are two and the same things, right? Mm -hmm. And, but funded through two different ways. So you could say, you know, I can, accomplish the same goal by investing in a person through a scholarship or that I enable this person to come to an institution where they can you know develop these skills and develop this leadership and you know they both said they learned a lot from their master who helped them and you know first said what makes you think you can do that that was his first thing and that's brought him on and they got into it so you know, you can accomplish the same things in different ways, mm -hmm. and I think it's entirely your decision, you know, where you want to do it. Mm -hmm. So would you say that making donors aware of those, like, individual investments that Yale is responsible for making is one of your more effective tools for um, kind of encouraging donor um, participation? The most effective tool is to find out what people are passionate about, what they really care about, and then match it with a need at the university. You can't turn somebody who is interested in helping young children, you can't compel this person to give a, you know, a, a jean order or something like that. It just doesn't work. So you have to be sensitive and have to find out what is it that this person wants to accomplish? You know, what is his dream or her dream? And then show them that they can accomplish this dream at Yale. So you almost have a philanthropic approach to philanthropy then. Maybe. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Robert. Well, earlier you were talking about how a lot of the money that's donated to Yale goes toward research that furthers different scientific developments and how a lot of money goes toward community projects in the New Haven area. So obviously a lot of the money goes toward like social good, but do you ever feel as though like a very successful campaign could lead to a development of a lot of, or pursuit of luxuries that isn't sustainable at the university? Uh, tell me first what you mean by luxuries. Um, As in, uh, when just opportunities for the students and like just to make um, life m much more comfortable than it needs to be where this money could go toward some other area? Mm -hmm. I can say uh, in this particular campaign, um, 
that was probably not the problem because uh, at the same time where we tried to raise the money, we also lost six billion dollars of our endowment. So you know, there, the campaign didn't even make up for what we had lost. So we are still in a, in a time of you know where we have to shrink, um, you know, the organization. Um, I think there is a legitimate um, conversation to be had about, you know, how much comfort, you know, what is important uh, for for uh, a you know for a student. Is it the sense of community? Is it the, the great academics? Is it you know having wonderful facilities, etc.? I think we can we could argue a little bit about you know how well equipped should a residential college be or you know I, I think there are voices on both sides of it um, but I th but at the same time in the in our campaign we had primarily academic goals to strengthen you know uh, to branch out into new areas that we didn't teach yet uh, to to secure much more financial aid because you know we were almost fully endowed for financial aid before the crash we spent about $60 million a year on it, and we had almost as much income from scholarship endowments. And with the financial crash, uh, what happened is not only you know, um, did we lose part of that endowment, but we had much more students who became eligible, who needed it. So now we moved from $60 million a year to about $100 million a year in financial aid expenditures. And so we, we wanted to raise money you know, for, for that, et cetera. So the campaign and the, and the crash kind of, uh, I think, um, did not allow for this kind of stuff to happen. But I can see that we all have to be careful. And I think student voices to be heard in that would be good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Inga, you uh, said a f uh, several themes that I find compelling. <coughs> One is about the longevity of an institution like Yale over time. And you mentioned about how the endowment allows Yale to, in some ways, operate without the pressures of a particular po political moment, mm -hmm. which Berkeley and other state universities have suffered, mm -hmm. or they can benefit depending on a particular moment. Uh, while at the same time, it has ongoing operational issues that are affected. Is, is there a, a balance that is reached that sometimes are murky? And when I say that, I talk about, say, a time when I was here, mm -hmm. when we were, uh, as an institution, dealing with issues that were being raised internationally around apartheid and mm -hmm. investments in South Africa that, 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 that had a, um, that were taking people in, in many different directions. H how, h how does a university, a great one like this, deal with those kinds of tensions between endowment for long-term existence, short-term need, and big global issues? Well, uh, a university deals with these issues by having a really good president. <laughs> um, I think, you know, to strike that balance between what is core, what is crucial, what should we never give up uh, is important. And I think it's also fairly easy. Obviously, uh, a great university needs great faculty and needs great students, and so how do we how do we maintain that and how do we continue to to enhance it? And when you think of it that way, then you can think of a lot of different ways of how you have to go about it, and philanthropy can can play a role in it. I think we have to be careful about things that may be very short term. Um, you know, so for example, one particular major is running up, you know, everybody wants to be that, and there is this other major over here that nobody wants. So we could say, oh, if I were a businessman, I'll put more money into this and I'll get rid of that. But you know, things 
in science, in humanity, social science, they don't always work that way. And all of a sudden, this goes down again, and this goes up. In so you have to have a sense of what kind of an institution you want to be and maintain those programs, those values throughout the, you know, the shifts. Thank you. Thank you, Inga. Thank you, students. This has been Philanthropy in Action. I am Maxim Thorne. Inga Reichenbach, the Vice President of Yale University's fundraising, shared with us her passion for higher education and what it takes to make a great institution and how much we depend on our donors and the community to do what it takes to invest in our community and in the world. Now, what are you going to do to change the world?